Welcome back, everybody. This is Derek Kirby back for another Mavs post game. Now, it's going to be a, a little bit of a divisive one. Uh, I understand that. I understand that the team is struggling. They're still not at full strength. They still got four crucial players out. And the schedule's not getting easier yet. This could be a very, very harsh week for this team. But they drop one last night at home, 117 to 113 to the Denver Nuggets. Luka Doncic puts up a triple double in the in the loss, 35 points, 16 assists, 11 rebounds. Crazy what he was doing. I mean, he basically um, basically had a triple double nearly at halftime, and they were, you know, until the event, they made a push right before the half, but they were trailing for a lot of the first half, especially by a dozen or more points. And this was just a game that you felt like he was he was uh, hampered by not enough help. KP, yes, he does play in this game. KP was brutal last night. 6 of 18 from the field, 1 of 8 from 3. Uh, 16 points overall, yeah, that's nice. But, you know, more than just how he faltered in the clutch, uh, some of his plays just, they were lackluster. It was not a good night from KP. Again, we said when he came back, you were going to have some of these games here and there in that first month or so. He's, what, in his seventh game back? To, to expect that he would be firing on all cylinders every single night right now is, is not reasonable. But he had a rough game last night, and it was a big, big part of the story here. So, making matters worse, you have Tim Hardaway Jr., not playing great. Now he ends up for three point shooting, not great. Two of seven. He gets 19 and seven. Very solid production from him there. Seven of 18. He got cooking. And when Dallas really made that push in the third quarter, particularly after Hardaway got punched in the nuts by Jamal Murray and ejected from the game, it was around that time Dallas made a real push and had the door open for, you know, a chance to, to steal a win over a good team. It's another situation between Luka's awesome game and the advantage of having Murray ejected. You had a real opportunity to get it done. And you seesawed back and forth, ahead, behind, and it just came down to the clutch. You were in a tie game with four and a half minutes left, and you didn't make enough plays. Worse, those plays that weren't made were on the defensive end. So Luka already doesn't have great nights from for a while Hardaway he got cooking and it looked good in the end but for a good chunk of that first half especially not great Burke not near as good last night as he has been overall for the year and especially in the bubble last year so that puts you behind the eight ball but really to me it, it's about the defense the Mavericks were at one point the second rated defensive efficiency team in the league despite facing the hardest schedule in the league to that point and I think they still have that uh, recognition at this point now. But it was brutal what's happened here. With these guys out, without Dorian Finney-Smith, without Maxi Kleba, without Josh Richardson, um, you know, I'm not going to worry about mentioning Powell. He brings something to the team, but not especially on the defensive end. Really, you're missing your three best perimeter defenders. I mean, maybe Luka can have a conversation there, but you're missing three very key defenders. And the defensive efficiency for this team has just dropped out. And what's worse is that while this team was the third-rated scoring offense last year, yeah, they give you 113 last night, but it's they don't have enough firepower. It's not the same this year offensively for this team. And so your defense is suddenly gone. It's not as bad as last year's defense because Luka's taken tremendous strides. And, uh, you know, you have KP on the floor now. So it's not as bad as last year's defense, but it's still nowhere close to what it was before the last Denver game when the COVID thing ran rampant through the, the locker room and you had four guys out. By the way, how is it that teams are having games postponed when they have no positive tests, but they're postponed due to uh, contact tracing, and yet the Mavericks have been without four, four to six players for now two weeks, and we're still, we've missed one game. We had one postponement. How does that make sense? Like, 
it's it's crazy. It, it would be so much to their advantage to just have a couple games get postponed and, you know, stop the bleeding a little bit there until we get some of these guys back. Because Richardson, Richardson in particular, is back in uh, conditioning drills now. And based on his his kind of insinuation of it, it it's kicked his ass. Like, post-COVID has kicked his ass in terms of his energy levels. He's struggling. He's, I don't know how soon it's going to be before he's back. He's, he's not sick with it anymore, but it just takes such a toll on your body that can last you know, a good while after. Now, he is a, a professional athlete in the top 1% of healthy specimens you would assume in the world. So for that reason, it'll be faster than like if it kicked my ass and I had to come back from it and be any kind of active, let alone at that level. But it seems like that still might be a little bit off in terms of when reinforcements come. Again, that's one guy, but that's, to my knowledge, the only guy that's back in conditioning drills even. So I don't know how soon this gets better. But the defense for the Mavericks has dropped off in a big way, and it's very problematic for this team. Last night... Last night, it was Michael Porter Jr., who, if you go back to the 2018 draft, Any and I, not thinking the Mavericks were going to trade up, we were debating between Michael Porter Jr. and Mo Bamba, and we wanted Michael Porter Jr., even if, even with the knowledge that he would miss probably the entire rookie year, which I believe he did. So, you know, fair point. The guy's got something. 28 minutes, 30 points, 8 rebounds. 10 of 18 from the field, 6 of 10 from 3, including several big shots down the stretch. A dagger with 41 seconds that pushed the lead to 7. The dude was awesome. A couple steals as well. He's a, he's a very good catch-and-shoot score. Very fearless in that regard. I hated the way the Mavericks were defending him. And you could call on that to Carlisle to an extent. I, I understand that. The Mavericks were just continuously losing him in space. All he wanted to do was catch and shoot, or catch, stare down, shoot. The fact that the Mavericks never once made him put it on the deck is, I, I think that's just ridiculous. That That's unforgivable. And you could talk about like, hey, if you had a healthy Richardson or Dorian or even Maxi having to guard him in that situation, it's probably a different story. I think that's fair to say. I do. But that man, that absolutely killed this team. He was he was what they couldn't deal with down the stretch. You know, Jokic, 20 points, 10 boards, 4 assists. 8 of 13, very nice there. 1 block and 2 steals. So he didn't kill you, but he absolutely creates chaos. You know, he averages nearly 9 assists per game, which I think they threw up a graphic on the, on the screen last night during the broadcast, that... It's the most assists per game in NBA history for a guy six foot ten or bigger. Now you put that distinction in there because you have uh, like Magic Johnson, what like six nine? Obviously, like you you work around it a little bit, but it still bears mentioning that it's the most assists all time by a guy of that size in terms of his per game. So he's he's tremendous. He creates absolute chaos if he gets the ball in the low post in uh, the half court set. And everyone always wants to speculate on the if Dallas somehow got him here, pairing him with Luka and KP, what kind of just destruction that would wreak. I get it. I see it. I just don't think it's going to happen. And so I, I don't put a lot of time or energy into that, even if Luka has joked about it a little bit. So, yeah, it's a, it's a frustrating loss. You were right there in the clutch. You waste another great game by Luka. And it comes down to just what your defense can do. And your defense without those crucial, crucial players is not good enough right now. So Dallas drops below 500 again on the season. They're going to now have a couple games, I believe, with the Jazz, which is going to be rough. And then they're going to have a couple games with the Suns. So it's not getting easier super soon, and that's going to be problematic. So yeah, you got two with the Jazz. Uh, both consecutively at Utah. How does that work? Why is it not home and away? And then you're two straight home against the Sun, bo Suns both times. That's weird. That's weird. Usually it's a home and away. I guess they're trying to reduce travel a little bit. But uh, yeah, this team, this team is going to have to figure some things out. The good news is, yes, you're 10th in the West right now. 
but the the spread between basically four and ten is stupid close. You're like five and a half games out of the three seed right now. That's not bad. Now, you want to be closer, but that's not bad considering what it very easily could be uh, were circumstances a little bit different here. So let's take a look here. I want to look through some of my game notes I had. So in this game, early on, the Nuggets shooting the lights out when they were up ahead over Dallas by a dozen or so points. They're like 9 of 15 from 3 at that point. That's 60%, and that's a big part of what kept them up handily throughout most of the first half. Even though Luka had 18, 6, and 8, the Mavericks were down 11 at that point, and that was with just a few minutes before halftime. So Luka, flamethrower, didn't matter because... For a time, now Hardaway turned it on, like I said, in the third quarter. But for a time, he didn't have Burke doing anything. He didn't have KP doing near enough. He didn't have, um, I said Hardaway already, Hardaway, Burke, and KP. Those role players weren't doing enough. And Brunson, Brunson's been very good for Dallas in the starting lineup this year. He's had a dud or two. He's had a couple duds, I think. But he's been very good in the starting lineup. And this was a discussion I had on Twitter uh, last night was, you know, when the guys come back, does Brunson stay in the starting lineup? I certainly don't think that he's played his way out of the starting lineup. He's He's been great in the starting lineup. But I still think you need to fix your defense. And Brunson's a decent defender. I don't think he's great, but he's a decent defender. If I can get Josh Richardson and Dorian Finney-Smith back out the, on the floor, I think that helps you. Dorian Finney-Smith was the Mavericks' best corner three-point shooter last year. And that's been one of their biggest weaknesses this year. They're like basically the very bottom three, if not last, in corner three-point shooting this year. And that's such a a key weapon for a team in a half-court set. You know, you create the penetration, you kick out for the shortest distance three-pointer. You have more guys that can spread the floor to that corner than they can the top of the arc. So that's a key weapon to have, and that's uh, bread and butter for Dorian Finney-Smith, who shot, like I said, like 38 39% from three last year. So that bears mentioning. I want him back for perimeter defense. I want Josh Richardson back for perimeter defense. And of course, Brunson and Maxie don't play the same position, but I want Maxie out there. And so to me, while Brunson has done everything you could ask, and there's certainly going to be nights where you want to run him out there and still start him and get the production, I think it's still more important that you fix the defense because the offense hasn't woken up yet. And until you get things going, maybe fix that corner three shot a little bit, I don't think you're going to start to turn that corner offensively. And so I want to focus on fix the defense. Let's lean into our strength right now. Once we have everyone back, it's our strength again. And then we'll figure out from there. And there's going to be nights where you have Brunson. But anyway, uh, for the Nets, in the fourth quarter, they opened on a nice run, a 10-3 run that flipped the game. And a lot of that was Michael Porter Jr., Getting it done on both ends, you know, not just splashing threes, but he got a couple steals in there, picked off a Luka cross-court pass that had Luka, it looked like he had eyes in the back of his head, but he threw a a zinger of a pass uh, across his own face through the lane, and Porter Jr. saw enough of it, got a hand on it, and took it the other way. That was a a pretty big thing there. Let's see, Luka, another note here. This is from Mavs PR on Twitter. Finished the first quarter with 14, 5, and 7 assists. So 14 points, 5 rebounds, 7 assists. It's the third straight game he recorded double figures in the first quarter and the seventh time in 15 games. That's pretty impressive in that regard as well. Luka's getting off to hot starts in these games, but because he doesn't have enough help around him. And by the way, everyone who's talking about like, hey, free Luka, free Luka, he deserves better than this. I understand Luka's never had to lose in his career and that this is frustrating for him. But it's also the reality that he w- he came to a team in the bottom, uh, you know, in the bottom of the the league at that point. A lottery team got him. His rookie year was all about Dirk's farewell, and the team was nowhere close to built out to compete. They won like thirty three or thirty four games. His second year, they made the playoffs, and he electrified, was a top five MVP candidate. And now this year, he hadn't even had a single game with his entire team. By the time KP came back, they had already lost the other four guys. Five guys, as Hardaway would go out then with the groin injury. So he hasn't had close to a healthy team yet. And so this notion that, hey, 17 games into the year, 
free Luka. He deserves better than this. He, the Mavericks either need to blow up everything or they need to get, um, you know, blow up everything or get, you know, major help in here. The help's already on the roster. I understand the Mavericks don't have the same shooters around them as Denver has. Denver has a lot of very capable shooters. And, you know, that's their strength and their advantage in that regard. But they don't have they don't have a weapon quite the same as Luka. Jokic is great. Jamal Murray is a phenomenal scorer when he really dials in. But, you know, Luka makes these shooters better, and he hasn't had his full artillery yet. If you lose a narrow game without five guys last night, or four guys, I guess at this point it is, I'm going to go out on a limb and say Dallas, at full strength, can take on Denver. I know Murray was gone for the the last, what it was, a quarter and a half maybe of that game, and that probably makes it more than a four-point you know win for Denver. But again, Dallas is absolutely devastated, has been devastated more than any other roster in the NBA with guys being out, and out for an extended period of time. This is something that I think, I still hold to this. If Dallas can weather this storm without these guys, and again, this is probably going to be a brutal week, but if they can weather this storm, when those guys come back, I think they will be better for it. More battle-tested, more, you know, they'll have gotten guys into a rhythm on the bench uh, who won't be asked to do as much. But when you're having to run Willie Cauley-Stein out there, who had, I, I think, a brutally bad game last night. Looked like he was out of place, like he didn't know what he was doing defensively, wasn't boxing out, wasn't... I mean, I mean, at one point, he was like 14 minutes in the game without a rebound. That's... That's so bad. He he benefited so much from having Maxi Kleba next to him in the front court. So he's better than Dwight right now, I think. But man, oh man, did, does he get exposed when he doesn't have Maxi next to him some nights. So that, when you're having to run guys like that and Wessa Wundu and some of these other guys that are having to reach down the bench and throw into these situations, you're not going to, you're not going to be the better for it. Now, long term, you can be. But I'm talking about like winning and losing right now. You're not going to win a ton of games when you're having to rely on these guys for 20 or 30 minutes in a night. They're nice players to have towards the end of your bench and to get something out of. But ideally, you're not having to bank on them for 20, 30 minutes a night. So that is what it is. Uh, this is from Chuck Cooperstein on Twitter. He says, Mavs have to figure out the defense here before long. They're 25th or lower in points allowed, field goal percentage, three-point percentage, and defensive rating over the last seven games. Key phrase there at the end. Over the last seven games, they are 25th or lower in field goal percentage, three-point percentage, and defensive rating. Those guys that aren't there right now are everything for this team's defensive presence. Again, your three, three of your four best perimeter defenders are gone right now. And your offense, while it's starting to figure things out a little bit, is nowhere near what it was last year when it was top three in scoring offense and the most efficient offense in NBA history. And a big part of why it's not that is because those guys have been out. But it's, uh, it's very important to note that. That's why when they get back, I want to throw everything lineup-wise at the defense and trust that the offense will continue figuring it out because you don't have to be number three in scoring offense. If you can be top ten in both categories – you're there and you're legitimate in terms of like an argument to contend. They're not there yet. This was just a funny observation from uh, Reese Conkle on Twitter. He's talking about the the nature of how plus minus is kind of a silly structure. And I know it's like how many points you give up defensively, how many points are like considered against you versus what you're doing on the offensive side. But Luka led the game in points, rebounds, assists, steals, shot 48% from the field, 38% from three, and was a perfect 10 of 10 at the line, and he was only a plus eight. <laughs> that's uh, that's a little interesting. He's 16 assists, five turnovers, and he works out to a plus eight. It is what it is, man. ESPN Stats and Info says Luka's 35, 16, and 11 is his third career 35, 15, and 10 game. According to Elias Sports, he's the only player in NBA history to do it multiple times before turning 22, and the only guy, and only one guy did it once at such a young age, that being Michael Jordan in 1985. So, 
historic stuff he's doing here. It's his 16th 30-point triple-double before turning 22. That's as many as every other player in NBA history combined. Luka is Luka's playing like an MVP. The problem is, because this team is ravaged by their health situation, and they're going through this brutal, brutal stretch of the schedule, and those two things having to line up the way they did, it's just more than they can overcome right now. I'm not... I'm not out on this team. I'm not freaking out or stressed that they're going to fall apart or come unglued or anything like that. I think they just have to weather this storm. I think they'll be better for having weathered this storm. And I still like their chances against most anybody in the playoffs. There's one, maybe two teams I'm not super confident about. But, you know, I'm not stressing. So I know a lot of people, whether you're Mavs Twitter or God help me, Mavs Facebook are melting down, want to fire Rick, want to uh, trade or cut a bunch of these other guys. I get it. Like, I get where that emotional reaction comes from. But I think when you look at the big picture and you look at what's what can be fixed right now to make this season as good as it can be, you're not going to find anything major. Maybe something presents itself along around the time of the trade deadline and you can do something there. That's certainly an interesting conversation worth having because the deadline's not terribly far off. But, you know, you got to see. I also know the Mavericks have been burned in the past by making by taking what was already a very good team but maybe not a favorite to win the title that year and then making a big midseason trade and it just shatters everything from the spacing to the chemistry uh, of the locker room and everything it becomes a distraction and it tears the team apart to the point where you had a team you thought could be in the western conference finals that year and instead they don't even they win like what one game in the playoffs that being the rondo trade i'm referring to there but i think the mavericks are going to be cautious and they're going to look at things very closely to make sure they don't repeat history on a negative side but if they can get if they can pull the trigger on a big acquisition something significant i don't think they're going to be willing to trade the only way I think they would even entertain the idea of trading KP would be if it was like a monster acquisition. I don't think they want to trade KP. I think that, you know, people complain about KP and how many games he misses and things like that. They're like, oh, $150 million player, and he's playing half the schedule. Well, again, he wasn't ready to go first and foremost the minute the season started, but he was close, and the Mavericks are who made the decision to work him in slowly and to manage him. The Mavericks, it's their money, not yours. And they're the ones making these determinations because they're trying to preserve him as much as possible. And only once they absolutely had to bring him in did they finally feel comfortable to bring him in this year. And him not playing five games in seven days, that's a hard ask for anybody. I mean, just look at how the rest of the Mavericks performed in that game um, a couple nights ago and tell me, that, you know, the, what was it, the Rockets game when they got blown out in the end. Look at that game then and tell me that the rest of the team, even the guys who played, that oh, did, did they really make a difference? You know, you talk about like, oh, KP can't play five games in seven days. <laughs> Scrub. All right, well, the team played like ass for the most part in that game. So are we going to have a conversation about how they're scrubs? No, you're only appending it to KP. Could he have physically been out there? Yeah, he probably could have given you 15 minutes, but the Mavericks, again, are managing because they don't want fatigue to lead to you know stress on the joints or anything like that where he's risking another ligament or tendon or whatever in either knee or feet, whatever. They're going to manage him as carefully as they can, and that's it's early season. That's when you do it. Where you start to get stressed about that is if you're desperately trying to make a playoff push in the final 15 20 games of the year and you're having to miss kp for several rest games then that's when you can then be a little bit more validly concerned or frustrated right now i'm not sweating that kp missed the 14th game of the year or something because of rest given the stretch that they went through but anyway uh, i'm off on a different subject here Mavericks lose this game 117 to 113. Had an opportunity. We've said that many times this year. The clutch is still a, uh, a cruel mistress for the Mavericks that they'll have to figure out. Luka's great game goes for naught, but this team is still nowhere near full strength, so we can't assume or believe that we know what their ceiling is. So 
That's it for my time. Don't forget to drop a like, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.